responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors and to Abraham and his children forever. In 1964, the musical Fiddler on the Roof took Broadway by storm. It was the first musical theater run in history to surpass 3,000 performances. Fiddler held the record for the longest running Broadway musical for almost 10 years until Greece surpassed its run. The production was extraordinarily profitable and highly acclaimed. It won nine Tony Awards, including Best Musical, Score, Book Direction, and Choreography. It spawned five Broadway revivals and a highly successful 1971 film and has enjoyed enduring international popularity. Fiddler on the Roof starts out with Tevia, a poor dairyman, discussing the basis for every decision that is made by him for his family. Tradition. Tevia explains in the opening number, because of our traditions, we've kept our balance for many, many years. Here in Anatepka, we have traditions for everything. How to eat, how to sleep, even how to wear clothes. For instance, we always keep our heads covered and always wear a little prayer shawl. This shows our constant devotion to God. You may ask, how did this tradition start? I'll tell you, I don't know, but it's a tradition. And because of our traditions, everyone knows who he is and what God expects him to do. It was tradition that would govern Tevia's process for his daughters finding a suitable husband. And when the daughters wanted to marry for love, it pushed against his process and he had to reevaluate everything. You know, a change in process is what G brought Jesus to this world. Prior to Jesus' coming, the Old Testament taught regular sacrifices to pay the price for our sins, but Jesus flipped the process and he became the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. In Mary's musical moment, she acknowledges that God has a process, that his process is holy and merciful. In this series, we're looking at the Magnificat, also known as Mary's Song of Praise in Luke chapter one. And today we look at how Mary sang about God's process. So the third part of the Magnificat begins to deal with God's process. The process I believe is founded in John chapter three when God sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. John 3.16, we all know it, for, God, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. This process is for all who believe. It's the process by which God provides forgiveness for our sins. So look at what Mary's saying in Luke 1, verse 49. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. So the first thing I want you to write in your notes this morning is this, is that God's process is based on his holiness. God's process is based on his holiness. Verse 49, for the mighty one is holy. Mary sang these beautiful words describing the character of God. For the mighty one is 
holy. God is holy. There's no fault in him. The fact that he is holy is the reason that he can do the right thing. The right thing was to begin this process of redemption for us. And you and I are called to walk in holiness as well. Jerry Bridges described it like this. He said, this call to a holy life is based on the fact that God himself is holy. And because God is holy, he requires that we be holy. Many Christians might have, might have what we call a cultural holiness. They adapt to the culture and pattern behavior pattern of Christians around them. As the Christian culture around them is more or less holy, so these Christians are more or less holy. But God has not called us to be like those around us. He has called us to be like himself. Holiness is nothing less than the conformity to the character of God. As used in Scripture, holiness describes both the majesty of God and the purity and moral perfection of His nature. Holiness is one of His attributes. That is, holiness is an essential part of the nature of God. His holiness is as necessary as His existence, or as necessary, for example, as His wisdom or omniscience. Just as He cannot but know what is right, so He cannot but do what is right. God can't help Himself. His holy character is what causes Him to act. There's no evil inside of Him, only holiness. John wrote about this in, in Scripture in, in 1 John 1.5. He says, this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in Him at all. God's holiness is a complete absence of evil. There's no darkness in him, is all, in him at all. There's no evil in him at all. This holiness is forever. It's not something that you flip on and flip off for God. He doesn't change his character. He is continually holy. It's what John the Revelator described when he saw the scene in, in Revelation 4, he, in verse 8. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes inside and out. And day and night, day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the all, God, the Almighty, the one who always was, the one who is, and the one who is still to come. So he's continually holy. He was holy in creation. He was holy when Adam and Eve fell. He was holy in the flood and he is still holy today. He'll be a holy a billion years from now. Nothing changes because God is holy then. His process is holy. It's a holy covenant. That he makes with you and me. Psalm 111 verse 9 says he has paid a full ransom for his people. He has guaranteed his covenant with them forever. What a holy, awe-inspiring name he has. So this process then is based in his holiness. The second thing I want you to see is that God's process includes Doing great things for me. Verse 49, for the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. When we view God as a holy God, then we can realize that his process for us is good and not evil. Right? When, we've, when we view God in this mindset that God is holy, that he, he can only do what is right, then his process for us is good and not evil. Some of us don't understand that concept, though, because we've never seen it modeled in our lives. We see blessing as great things. Like when, when, when all of a sudden finances are good and health is good and everything that's going good in our life, that God has done great things for us. But do we realize that sometimes the testing and the correction of the Lord are great things as well? When I, when I correct my kids, I don't do it for my entertainment. 
I, I don't sit there and go, well, you know, I'm kind of bored tonight. Uh, let, Kenzie, come in here. Let me correct you. Why? I, I, don't, I mean, that's not fun for me. You know, my dad used to say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Liar. That's what I thought. Until I became a parent. And then I realized, this is not fun. There's no, nothing fun about correction. Why? I want my kids to act right. I want them to do the right thing. So when I correct, I do it for their benefit, not my entertainment. Everything God does for us is so that we can experience everything he has for us. Let me say that again. Everything God does for us, all the blessing, all the correction, all the discipline, everything God does for us is so that we can experience everything he has for us. He does great things for us. We looked at this passage a couple of weeks ago as it related to praise. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. But what I want us to do is focus on the second part of that verse. In Psalm 103.2, says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins. And heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. And so what are the good things that God has done for us? Sometimes when you think, man, I'm, I'm going through a rough patch here in my life. And, you know, it seems like everything's stacking up against you. You need to go back and read this verse again because God has done great things for you. Whether your today is going like you think it needs to go or not, whether your tomorrow is going to go like you think it needs to go or not, God has still done great things for you. What has he done? He forgives all my sins. God offers forgiveness. If we sit there and took a journal, if we took a journal and you began to write every bad thing that you ever, ever did, you just sit there. And you, and you wrote, man, when I was five, I stole a piece of candy. When I was six, you know, I tied my granddaddy's shoes together in church. <laughs> True story. And when I, well, we won't talk about that one in sixth grade. But I'm, I'm just saying, we go down the list and of the bad things and the things that we've done. And, and we write down all the stuff that we've done wrong, all the things that we've messed up. And guess what God does? He rips that out. He casts it as far away as the east is from the west. And he says, you're forgiven. He forgives your sin. Guess what else he does? He heals your diseases. He heals your diseases. He makes a way for you to have divine healing. Man, I'm telling you, there have been times in my life, I remember when I was in Bible college and I was struggling and I'd been working and I just struggling with this cold and I walked into a church on a Sunday night. Walks to Hatchie, First Assembly of God. And I walked in there that night and wasn't the church I normally attended because I didn't have time to get to the one in Dallas that I normally went to. So I just slipped into this church. And in the middle of worship, I'm, I'm sick. I don't feel like being there, but, you know, I'm a Bible college student. What else am I supposed to do? You know, I skip church, stay at home? No. I mean, I'm, I've got to, you know, I've got to come when I'm sick. i got to do, you know, and so I'm there. And I'm just like, God, I don't feel good. i got finals coming up. I'm working all these hours. And I just begin to worship the Lord and guess what happened boom my sinus is cleared up right in that moment God touched me and healed me in that moment listen God healed we see it sometimes we think and we say oh it's, it's cancer oh diabetes oh a heart issues and all that and this big stuff but guess what God heals the little stuff too he made a way by his stripes we are healed he redeems me from death Guess what, man? I, I guarantee you, there's coming a day. Every single one of us are going to face this one way or the other. Either Jesus is going to come back for us, and, and we're going to be, we're going to be uh, caught up together in the air, or we're, go we're going to pass away. And people are going to come to our funeral, and then they're going back to the church and eat potato salad. That's the way it works, right? <laughs> Regardless... He redeems me from death. I don't have to spend eternity in hell. Come on, that's good news, church. 
He crowns me with love and tender mercies. What does, what does that mean? He accepts me into his family. He accepts me into the body. He accepts me into the kingdom of God. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the evils. Guess what, guys? God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. He doesn't want to hoard from you. He wants to pour out blessing on your life. God wants great things for your life. He wants you to live in alignment with the word of God so that you can experience all the great things that he has in store for you. There's a song in, in, in Psalm chapter uh, 120 about through one, some, that era there. There was a bunch of songs that were called the songs of the ascent. And what the songs of the ascent are is, is simply when they would make the uh, trip up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was like up a hill, you know. And so when they would go up the hill to Jerusalem, they would sing these songs together, reminding them about the greatness and the goodness of God. And so Psalm 126 says, When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. Church, I'm telling you, God wants to do great things for your life. And his process is filled with great things. God's process is also a, a, a show of mercy. Verse 50, he shows mercy from generation to generation. A few weeks back, we went to a wedding of uh, a couple of our former students. And, and, and one of the grandfathers of the stu one of the students uh, was a man I hadn't met. I'd heard about him, but I'd never met him before. He's a military veteran, and he had served in the country of Panama. Well, my grandfather, my, who we called Papa, uh, pastored in the country of Panama for 16-plus uh, years, and the majority of his congregation was uh, military uh, personnel. Uh, he was in the canal zone, and, and he was there in, in, in a time. And, and this man attended Papa's church. So as, he, as we were talking, he, he shared with me a story that I had not heard about my grandfather before. And my papa had kind of, uh, I remember being with him in Panama at the age of 10 and uh, being in the little van that uh, he, he like drove us around. And I'm telling you, I have never been more scared in my life with somebody driving the vehicle. And I've taught Maddie how to drive. So, I mean, I, I've, I've, never, I've never been more scared. This, Papa was just weaving out. And he goes, this is how you have to drive down here. And I'm going nuts and crazy. Well, you can imagine at some point during his, his time down there, he got a ticket. And it's not like up here in America, we just kind of go pay, you know, pay the fine or, or you know, take defensive driving if, if, unless you've gotten a ticket, you know, you know, time soon. Never, just not talking from experience there, but I'm just uh, saying, maybe, well, maybe I am. But anyway, he, he, he got this ticket, and it was during the reign of Noriega. And if, if you remember, those of you who have been around a while, remember that was a very tense time in the country of Panama. And, and so here's a foreigner who gets a ticket in the country, and he's got to go stand before the judge. So he goes in, and he, he stands before the judge, and the judge looks at Papa, and he says, Sir, we are going to give you justice here. And my Papa was a little bit of a charismatic guy, and he said, Judge, I don't want justice, I want mercy. And the judge got so tickled, he laughed kind of like you guys did. He got so tickled that he dismissed the case right there and gave Papa mercy that day. He was able to walk right out. Did Papa deserve mercy? No, he deserved justice. He had broke, he had broke the law. I'm telling you because I've, I've ridden with him down there. I know he, he did it. He would probably tell you he did it. Every single one of us deserved justice. But God dismisses the case and he says, I give you mercy. His process is a process of mercy. 
We don't deserve God's process. But that's why it's called grace. That's why it's called mercy. Ephesians 2, 4 says, But God is so rich in what? Mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. So God's process is to show mercy, but it's also inclusive. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 50. He shows mercy from generation to generation. He doesn't show mercy to a select few. Now, when we think generations, what do we think? We think the greatest generation. We think the boomer generation, generation X. We think the millennials, the new generation, generation Z that they're calling. We, we think of all these different generations. Here's the thing. God's mercy is good for every single generation. His love is available to everyone. It's inclusive. Psalm 105, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Get, get this, it wasn't just for the disciples. It just wasn't for the early church. It wasn't for your grandparents' generation. God's mercy is for every. One, it's for every generation. Peter had this discovery after hearing about how God orchestrated his meeting with Cornelius. In Acts 10, verse 34 and 36, it says, Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of the good news for the people of Israel. That there is peace with God through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. See, sometimes I think in America we don't kind of get this concept. Because we look at some people and we say, you know what, I'm not sure you're going to get into heaven. If I was God, you definitely wouldn't be getting into heaven because you've done too many bad things. So we, what we do is we weigh it out in scales. This is everything bad that they've done. This is everything bad. So they don't, they don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve the process. But God says, listen, it's available for everyone. Because I show my mercy from generation to generation. No strings attached. You don't have to have some kind of special background. You don't have to come from some kind of special family. Get this. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks you live on. It doesn't matter who your mama or your daddy was. God's mercy is available for you. See, God's process, what's, what's, what does it require? It simply requires this. God's process requires fear. Look at verse 50 again. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. The onus is on us at that point. point. It's our responsibility then to trigger the favor and blessings of God through our commitment to him. So we need to fear him. Now, what I'm not talking about is I'm not talking about being scared of God. Like, oh, oh God, God, you know, he, he doesn't want us to be scared. In fact, his scripture tells us to come boldly before the throne. I'm talking about having a holy reverence for who he is. How, how can I describe this to us? What do you do when you see a police car while you're driving down the road? <laughs> do you ignore it? Do you ignore it? Have, has anybody ever been looking at your, at your cell phone or something? You got a text or something, you look at your cell phone, all of a sudden you look up and there's an officer like right there, where you're, like you throw the phone on the other side of the car, <laughs> you know, something like that. You're changing the song on your Spotify or whatever. I mean, what do, you, what do you do in those moments? Are you driving down? I mean, you're driving down over here on, uh, you know, College Street and, you know, it's 30, 35, I mean, it's 30, 35, goes back to 30, and all this kind of, it's like, you know, and you're driving down, and all of a sudden you see one of those little black SUVs coming down the uh, road, the Ford Explorers, you know, and talking about, you know, don't, don't have real bright letters on the side, they just say, you know, there, I'm just telling you, what do you do in that point? Do you slow, you slow down, 
You extinct. You may not even break, be breaking the law, but what do you do? You still break. Do you make sure your cell phone's not in your hand? Do you check your inspection sticker to see if it's in date? Guilty. Every time. I know my mar- mine doesn't go out till March, but if I see an officer, I'm immediately looking over. Why? Because I've been busted a couple of times for an expired spe- inspection sticker. You know? Some of you have PTSD because of how many times you've been stopped. You know, I'm just saying. Not, not, not pointing anybody out in the church this morning. Just saying. How do you respond? I would venture to say most of us have some sort of reaction to seeing a police car. Why? Because we have a reverence for what could happen if we're breaking the law. It's a awe, a fear. It's not we're scared. I'm not scared of the officers. I invited them to church. We, we, have, we had them come over here that day and, and police cars all throughout the parking lot. I see them. I'm in meetings with them now and do different things. And I, and I see them. I'm friends with them. And guess what? I'm not afraid of them. But when I'm out on the street... And I see one of them. I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. God's always watching. He's all-knowing. He sees all. Yet we tend to live our lives like we have a spiritual radar detector. Until the pastor preaches on our sin, we don't do anything about it. As long as we don't get caught, we just go on business as usual. Having a fear of the Lord means we continually stand in awe of the sacrifice that Jesus made, and we don't trample on that grace. We accept it. Oh, that's good. We choose not to sin. Get this. We choose not to sin because we know the price that was paid for it. That's what it means to have a a fear of the Lord. God, we know that you sacrificed your son Jesus for us. And so we're going to choose not to sin. We're going to choose to accept the grace of God. We fear God enough to know he has the power to judge and that he has the power to forgive. Psalm 103 verse 17 says, But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments. Let's pray together today, Father.